But let, let me introduce um, uh, Dr. Dan. Would you mind uh, coming up? Um, let me let me just say something real quickly. I, I do teach at the University of Texas at Austin, so no refunds to anybody who went there. I'm sorry, uh, and uh, your your children are in good hands mostly, uh, as far as I could tell, uh, if they if they show up to my classes. But I want to say something. When I teach uh, journalism uh, at school, I talk about something called the great counterintuitive, uh, and by that I simply mean that in journalism, good journalists. The, the ones who come without bias, the really good ones, do something hopefully repeatedly uh, that is counterintuitive. They go to the apocalypse. They get in their car and they drive to Hurricane Katrina. They uh, go to theaters of war. And then there are people who do it, citizen journalists, let's call them, who stand up in their seats in the back of a... Uh, of an airplane and decide we better rush the cockpit because some terrorists have taken over the plane. That's the great counterintuitive. I like to teach that. It's a, my $10 phrase. But uh, there are certainly people who do that in life. I'm not sure that I'm one of them, uh, but I'm standing next to someone who did something that truly was the great counterintuitive. He decided uh, rather than run away from the apocalypse, the nightmare, the storm, the greatest man-made disaster in American history, he decided to race to it and then frankly do what? To see if he could help. Uh, it's, uh, it's a human impulse. I like to think it's refined maybe here in the United States to a certain degree. Uh, but let me turn it over to Dr. Dan who will, who will tell you about his experiences doing that great counterintuitive. Thanks, Bill. Well, we're... Uh, <clears throat> getting started here. I'm uh, very pleased to be able to come back and uh, talk to you folks again. And uh, I want to set another 1947 uh, connection here. I was in the United States Army in 1945. And in 1946, uh, I was trained as a medical surgical technician. And the Army does a very good job of uh, teaching. And uh, uh, I gained quite a, quite a bit of medical experience in that session. How did I become involved in this? One day, the colonel who headed up uh, our clinic at Fort Sam Houston called me in and says, pack your bags and go home. Everybody's discharged. A little, louder, a, little louder, a little bit louder? Okay, all right. I'll hold it a little bit closer. Uh, <clears throat> so I got out of the Army in uh, November 1946 and went back to home in Pasadena, Texas, and immediately enrolled in the University of Houston in the spring of 1947. So here was the 1947 connection. On the day that this disaster happened, I was sitting in the cafeteria, and the radio announcer uh, on the, on the uh, speakers came in and said, there's been a terrible explosion in Texas City and they need anybody that has any medical experience to come and help. So rather than go to class, I went out, caught a ride to uh, Pasadena and joined up with some doctors. We went to uh, Texas City. This disaster happened at, uh, and I'm gonna show one of Bill's slides again. It happened in the uh, morning at 9.12 and we arrived in Texas City about just about noon so we were fresh on the on the uh, on site, and I want to bring a couple of corrections or notices here. Uh, Bill showed you. Let me go back here. Bill showed you where the uh, the Grand Camp was uh, uh, at Dockside. Well, I keep hitting high tech. One of the things I want to point out here uh, before we get started, because I'll come back to it several times, here's where the ship was docked. This is a residential area, and right in here was a uh, car garage, fairly large uh, garage. Uh, the floor space was probably about half of this room because he did quite a bit of uh, work, McGar um, uh, automotive repair. 
down this road was is where we approached the uh, the site when we got there. There was no one in control. Nobody was uh, in command. Nobody was telling somebody to do this or do that. So it was a lot of middling around at the very first. There was a large tank right here. And this picture is not uh, accurate for uh, Texas City at the time. But a large oil tank, which I'll show soon, that was on fire. And so there was quite a bit of uh, uh, confusion and destruction uh, that was happening. Uh, right here, just outside the dock, was the uh, a very large oil barge. And the barge was beached uh, on, on dry land. And up here, much higher than I could reach, was a fire truck. The force of the explosion had blown the, the uh, barge out of the water and then in, uh, actually welded the fire truck to the bar, just how, how much the explosion uh, really took, uh, took care of the local area. So here is the, the tank that's on fire that you can see here. Uh, these buildings are going right down to the dock in this particular area. By the time we arrived, most of the wounded people had been taken out of the local area. And that was one of the things that caused a big problem because as the wounded were picked up, put in ambulances that were coming in from all over the state, uh, we lost track of who was still uh, part of this, uh, this explosion. And they got, a lot of people got listed as dead who really weren't. They had just been moved out with no uh, information given about them. So by the time I arrived, it was pretty much a matter of let's go in and see if we find anybody still alive, but mostly let's start bringing out bodies. It's not a very good dinner conversation uh, topic. So we actually formed small teams. There'd be a team here that would say, we'll go down this way. Uh, another team would just pick up some stretchers and uh, we'd go down and looking for, looking for bodies. And we had to walk right under this. Boy, I'm really having a problem with here. We had to walk right under that burning tank. And what the explosion had done was torn the top edge of the lid, uh, or the lid uh, that covered the tank, and set it on fire, the fuel that was inside. It was just like a giant blowtorch and it was just uh, streaming a, a sheet of flame, and it was hot, and it, it was just making a heck of a lot of noise. In fact, you could hardly talk when you were right under that uh, particular tank. So <clears throat> this is some of the people that had just uh, uh, come down in an ambulance and took uh, the last of the wounded out, and we never saw another ambulance at all. So the team then started, this is from a, a cover from Life magazine in uh, April of uh, April of 21st, I think. And this is a good picture of exactly what we were putting up with. We had been down there for hours now, and we were dirty, it was muddy, it was oily, and it was just a lot of uh, milling around in confusion, trying to get the bodies out. And the problem was, we really had no, no place to put the bodies. So finally somebody said, well, let's take them up to that garage and we'll put them out on the floor and maybe we can get some morticians to come and uh, start the embalming process, which uh, was what happened. So we would pick up the bodies, take them back up that road, lay them out on the floor of the garage, and here's what complicated things. The force of the explosion pretty much uh, tore all the clothes and uh, a lot of body parts off of the uh, individuals that were caught in the explosion. <clears throat> and the, I don't know how many bodies we picked up that the only clothes they had on, the only thing they had covering them was a belt and some shoes. 
And in other cases, the bodies were uh, <clears throat> just literally blown apart. So we'd wind up with an arms, legs. And on one occasion, uh, one of the guys that was in my team, he came along and said, hey, uh, I don't, what do I do about this head? And I said, well, give it to me. And I put it on my arm. And the guy said, well, here's another one here. OK, give it to me. I put it on my other arm and took them up to the uh, garage. And when we got the body parts, arms, legs, heads, or whatever, we would take them up and then try and fit them to somebody that was already in the garage. And that was uh, not a very easy thing to do, as a matter of fact. In, in this picture, you can, you can see some of the bodies and some of the people moving up. Lots of smoke, lots of flame. And on the road that I showed you earlier coming down were some telephone poles. And up on one of the poles was a guy hanging by his safety harness. He had been a, a lineman. And the force of the uh, explosion uh, took away all of his clothes. He had a belt, and he still had his shoes on. And he was black. And this was back when he referred to in the days, it was before African American was invented. And uh, we just called him colored people. I thought, gosh, we got to get that guy down from there. So we finally got him down and discovered that he was not black, he was white. But the force of the explosion had completely blown enough oil and debris into the body that he had. Uh, and it was dry. It was first the blast, and then the heat would hit, and it would dry the, dry the skin on the body. But we finally got him down and took him into the, <clears throat> into the uh, garage shop. Another elderly couple were about, oh, I guess a quarter of a mile away. And the force of the explosion took part of the ship and blew it right through the passenger window on that couple's car and beheaded both of them. And they were a long ways from the actual explosion itself. So that gives you an idea of how much the, uh, the uh, force of the explosion. There was some uh, uh, possibility that I got caught up in one of the photographs. And if it was, it, that's me right there. And I'm not absolutely sure of that, uh, that fact. So here's a picture in the garage where we had the people laid out. And we did the best we could about collecting any personal effects. And uh, someone was telling me that, OK, why don't we put uh, wallets and things that we can identify. We'll just stick them in the mouth. And when the embalmers get there and the uh, funeral people, they can make a decision about what to do with them. Now, these bodies, as they were uh, embalmed in the garage, were taken down to the uh, gymnasium of the local high school. And this is a picture of the gymnasium and the uh, people that were there lined up to try and go in and identify uh, their, their uh, relatives or whoever they thought they uh, was in there. All right, at the end of the day, it was dark, getting dark. There was no, no power of any kind, no utilities of any kind, so we, had, we can't continue to look for bodies. So what do we do now? And somebody said, well, the hospitals down in Galveston need help because people were lined up in, in corridors, laying in waiting rooms, uh, on mattresses, on blankets, and they were just waiting to be treated. So I got in a car with another guy. We went down to uh, the nearest hospital, which I believe was St. Mary's. But John Seeley, we passed that up because they had all the help they needed there from the, <coughs> the medical uh, um, the students. 
here's what the situation was in the hospitals, and I was down there for about some 30 hours, I guess. The wounded were lying all over the place. Uh, there was, uh, medical supplies were dwindling, and the doctors in the crowd here, and I think Dr. Pat hadn't heard this either. Surgery was being performed uh, in makeshift uh, areas where the doctors that I was supporting, they were lying on sawhorses, and we had Coleman lanterns for light, and we ran out of uh, antiseptic altogether. So when the surgeons finished with whatever the cutting they were doing, I would take the instruments and put them in a bowl of uh, alcohol and slosh them around, clean them up as much as I could. They'd go right back into surgery and then start operating again. Um, I don't know whether to tell you about this or not. Uh, we came to a young guy whose leg was so mangled that they were going to have to amputate right then and there if they were going to save his life. The problem was we were now out of anesthesia. So the doctor said, we, we've just got no choice. We've got to go ahead and do it. So I held the guy down while they started uh, cutting his leg off. And that worked pretty well until the bone saw. When the bone saw started, uh, the guy came out of uh, his unconscious state and we had a terrible time holding him down. Another guy jumped on the table and helped hold him down until he completed the surgery. And we brought a young woman that looked, looked to be about 19 or 20. She had over a hundred over a hundred shrapnel penetrations of her body, and they had to go into every one of those situations and dig out the metal, and, uh, and gangrene became a very good possibility. So they had one entire ward of uh, the hospital was set aside for just nothing but gangrene cases, and when they uh, showed up. So after about 30-something hours, I just, uh, sort of uh, gave up, and I said, I gotta go get some rest somewhere. So I went over to the Hotel Galvez, which was a premier uh, hotel in Galveston for tourists and that sort of thing, and I walked in, I'm bloody, I'm dirty, I probably didn't smell very good, and uh, I asked the clerk, I, can you give me a room so I can get some rest, and he said, Sorry, fella, we don't have any rooms. And I said, well, I, I'll go out in the lobby and I'll allow on one of the, the lounge chairs. He said, well, you're over in Texas City? And I said, yes, and I uh, told him about being in the hospital and everything. He said, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a room. He took me up to the penthouse suite. <laughs> and I had that room for the next 15 hours that I slept. And I got up and I was so tired, I couldn't get my, my clothes off. I couldn't get my blouse or uh, my shirt over my head. And I had to call a bellhop, came up with some scissors and cut, <laughs> cut me out of my clothes. But during the night, they uh, somehow or other managed to find clean clothes for me. And when I woke up, I had a steak sandwich on the bed beside me. So they had uh, really took care of me well. So that ends my part of the story completely. And here are the, here are the end results as the Texas Highway, um, the Texas Department of Public Safety uh, figured out. There were 405 identified dead. There were 63 unidentified dead. And 113 just simply disappeared. We just don't know what happened with them. They were just disintegrated by the blast. And, uh, Probably a lot of them went, went into the water and got washed away. And that's the end of my story. I'm sure it's not a very happy one for, for this kind of a meeting. Bill? <laughs>